about the webinars. And then I'm going to briefly hand over to each of you to ask you to quickly introduce yourselves by your name, the organization you belong to, and then three words that you would use to describe your community. We have people from around South Africa today who may never have been to your particular community. So to start off, just to kick off, I'm going to ask you to do a quick um, word picture by choosing three words that would describe your community. That's just going to set the scene. Um, you're going to get a much bigger chance to speak thereafter. So once you've done that, we'll go into just doing a very brief overview of the hotspots and the change initiative. And then I'll ask, given a brief question, followed by Lindsay, followed by Farida, followed by Caroline, followed by Fanele, where figures have been going up. And then I'm going to come to you, Cookie, um, as being in a part of the country where we've seen some change for the better. So those are just the questions to get you talking and giving your thoughts. But thereafter, the conversation is very much open for you to start asking questions to each other, to add your own thoughts and insights. Um, I mean, you can use the raise hand function, uh, which I can. Theodora, would I be able to see it? Yes. OK. So you can use the raise hand function. Um, if you want to come in, otherwise I suppose you could also just speak um, to say your bit, and then we'll also be opening up to the audience for their for their points of view, and they'll also be using the chat function. So it's very much designed to be a conversation amongst yourselves, sharing your insights, your work, your day-to-day -day experience, and an opportunity to ask and raise questions, I think, to challenge us all to think somewhat differently. So treat it as a conversation. Um, I think everyone's really looking forward to what you have to say. There was a lot of interest uh, from this invitation. So people I think are very much listening, are keen to, look, to hear the voices of those at community level coalface um, and what we can learn from, from, uh, from you. Okay, now I have someone saying they can't get in. So is everyone happy? Any questions? Okay. It's just after half past one. Um, should we open up? Lily, I don't know if you've been able to get hold of Zanele. Please start. Okay. Lily, can we start? Is Zanele in? Or is that Mara Z DSO? Yes. Yes. Are you, is, is that Tanele, Mara? I've okay. just contacted her. Uh. And sent her the link. Okay. Um, Mara, are you Tanele or are you somebody else? Who's Tanele? Are you Tanele? Hello. Okay, I think let's start, um, Theodora. Okay, Liz. Okay, are we? Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us in our first webinar, which is going to be looking at how we can think somewhat differently beyond the criminal justice system and behavior change programs around addressing the serious problem of gendered violence in South Africa. So our very first webinar today is going to be looking at the importance of place or understanding what it is we can learn from geographies of violence in helping us to think and come up with 
some additional weapons or tools that we can use to tackle the problem of violence in our, in our very many communities. I mean, the starting point for this webinar is that a one size solution does not fit all. All places are not the same. And so what we want to be doing within this webinar is taking the opportunity, because we have so many of you from diverse parts of the country, to be thinking about your specific unique conditions and what we can learn by comparing and contrasting them to help develop a, a, a more enriched understanding of some of the things we can be doing to prevent and tackle gendered forms of violence. So thank you very much. Um, for, for, for being here today. This is going to be in, designed very much as a conversation, not a long series of presentations, but a conversation and the opportunity to engage with each other, to share your thoughts and your and particular experiences of your specific communities um, in terms of how we think about violence. Before I introduce the Gender the gender V project by UJ, I just want to check if um, Zanele, as the Masi Pepe Network, who's one of the partners in this webinar, would like to briefly introduce the Masi Pepe Network before I speak briefly about the Gender Violence, the Gender V project. Okay. Lisa, she should be on. Should I give her another uh, minute? Any minute. Okay. So while we wait for Zanele, just to give you a little bit of a background to the webinar, You'll see that it's hosted by a whole range of different partners uh, from the University of Johannesburg to the, the Gender Health and Justice Research Unit at UCT, as well as the Masi Pepe Network, um, CCI, who Zanele will be telling us a little bit more about. But it's not only a South African, but it's not only a South African project, it's also linked to a research project part that in India. So the, with the idea being to understand if we compare India and South Africa, what is it that we learn from the contrast between these two countries around violence? And our other partners in that are also Cambridge and Oxford universities in the UK. So this is very much a project about comparison. When you put things together, what do you learn about what needs to be present for violence to take place? And what do you also learn about what needs to be absent for violence to take place? So it's very much based on the idea that each community or area has its own unique specificities. And when we understand those, we might do better in trying to address the problem. I mean, I think national is an idea. There's no place in the country called national. You can go to someone's office and it's called national, but national is not a place. However, Delft, Lusiki Siki and Dipslurt are very definitely places. And so, Today's first webinar is designed to start taking the idea about place seriously in relation to violence. It's the first in the series. The one, the one next week is going to look very much, take these ideas further by looking at safety. So we'll be looking at what role safety acts and engineers who deal with transport infrastructure and local government can be playing in relation to gender violence. In our third webinar, which Gender Health and Justice Research Unit will lead, we'll be looking at the role of the health sector. I think we're very used to what the contribution of the courts and the police is to the problem of gender violence, but we're a lot less used to asking the health sector, especially in relation to domestic violence, about what it is that they can be contributing to helping us think more broadly and developing a more comprehensive response to violence. So that's the background to today's webinar and the overall series. Um, Lily, has Zanelli joined us? Uh, she should be here. Okay, so while we wait for Zanelli, I'm going to ask our panelists who each come from some of the uh, communities you want to focus on today where, where there has to be real prioritization, I think in terms of how we think about violence. So I'm going to ask them each briefly to introduce themselves so that you can get a sense of where they're coming from um, before we kick off the actual webinar. So Lindsay, can I start with you? Can you tell us where you're from? And also three words that you would use to describe Dipslot if you had to describe it to people who've never been there before. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for having me, Lisa. Um, as she said, my name is Lindsay Henson. 
I'm the executive director for a nonprofit organization called Lawyers Against Abuse, and we are based here in Dipslot. I'm in Dipslot now. Um, if I were to describe Dipslot in just three words, um, I would say it's very diverse. Um, it's bustling. And uh, I'm going to cheat here and use two words. Uh, in some ways, it's forgotten, and in other ways, it's exploited. So there, four words. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. You've already made it gotten me curious. C Caroline, can we go to you? Caroline, if you oh, there yes, you are. hi, hi, hi. Hello, everyone. I am Caroline Peters. I'm a feminist and human rights activist. I've been working in the gender rights field for close to 30 years. I started off as a rape crisis volunteer. I'm the I'm currently I'm the founder of an organization in a community called Kalas Foundation. I also coordinate the Cape Platts Women's Movement. Um, we run a support group for women that seeks a reprieve from domestic violence. Um, we, I also work with women in conflict with the law, women who abuse substance. Um, we've just joined with another organization, Men Stand Tall, to, um, to, to, to elaborate more on work with boys, young boys and young men. Um, yes, and so I've been, I live and work on the Cape Flats I also work for the Western, uh, the Women's Legal Center, um, coordinating their Defenders Program. And so I wear many different ad various ads, been around in the NPO and developmental sector for many, many years. Three words to describe the area that I come from. Um, so I work in Athlone, live and work in Athlone. The Athlone area comprise of, we are the oldest community um, I think it's an old community, an older community, one of the older townships that was established from the from District 6, you know, when people were displaced from District 6. So we're one of the oldest community. I think we're also one of the most organized communities in as much because we're an established community. So we're the oldest, we organize, and that's why organized crime thrives so much in the Athlon area. Thank you. And your three words. Organized, organized, old, old, organized. So old because we're an old township and mm -hmm. organized. And I think we show sure. also we, we, we very, very um, political. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Caroline. Cookie, can we go to you? Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, my camera's not working. So I think that most of you know me. Um, just like Caroline, 30 years in the field. I think Lisa and, and um, quite a few people in the group that I've seen, yeah, we come a long way. We were still spring chickens then. Um, I'm with the KZN Network on Violence Against Women, uh, based in uh, KZN. All eyes are on KZN at the moment. Is there anything else you have to add to describe your community's cookie? Yeah, we, uh, there's very really good working relationships with stakeholders and communities. Very good re relationships around the province. We have good networking, strong, if I could put it in a way, we have strong networking relationships. Excellent. Thanks, Cookie. Given, can we come to you? Sure. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, my name is Given Sikaoge and I am Sonke's uh, Communications and Strategic Informations uh, Unit Manager. I always say that's a very long way of saying my job is to just talk too much. Uh, but um, I think just briefly um, about Sonke. Sonke is a South African-based non-profit organization uh, working throughout Africa. And we believe in, we believe women, men, uh, girls and boys can work together uh, to resist uh, patriarchy advocate for gender justice and um, achieve uh, gender transformation. And in terms of uh, the three uh, words that I can describe Deep Salute, I think um, I, I don't particularly have words, but I have a sentence. Um, and and I, I like to say it's, it's full of life uh, despite being severely marginalized. It's a great description. Thanks, Given. 
Shall we go to you, Farida? Yes, good afternoon, can you hear me? Hi, good afternoon, yes. can you hear me? Um, hi, I'm Farida Reto. We can from, hear you, Farida. Uh, okay, I'm from Delft, I'm a human rights activist. I'm also um, part of, of the Defenders, Human Rights Defenders program that Karen was talking to. Um, she's actually our leader on that um, project. And then um, I'm also the director of Women Impacting a Nation. And so many people have asked me why such a broad name, Women Impacting a Nation. For me, a nation is, if you can impact one person, it's for me enough. Mm -hmm. Be able to make a, a change or difference in one person's life is the nation. One is a nation. For me, at least, that's a description I would say a nation. And if I had to describe Delft, it's very diverse. It's still very growing much every day. Um, how people are marginalized and they are definitely unsafe. Our area is quite unsafe. If you could look at I think 10 years from now, if you look 10 years from now, I could walk from the center to my house, not now anymore, and it's only five minutes away. Thank you, Farida. I mean, I think I'm already hearing some similarities between Delft and Dipslurt in that word marginalized. Thank you. Yeah. And then our last panelist is Fanele from um, Rusikisiki Paralegal Advice Office. Fanele, are you able to join us? Okay, I hope we can find Fanele. Hello, Lisa. Okay. Lisa, hello. Hello, yes, go ahead, Fanele. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yes, yes, Lisa, I'm Fanele Muni from Lusikisiki Paralegal Advice Center. I'm working here as a field worker under the supervision of Ms. Sopegwa. So our organization, is a human rights organization which was started in 1997. Because it was started because there were a lot of human rights violation in, in, in our area. So basically we are addressing these human rights violation in our in in in, in Lusikisiki. So Lusikisiki is a rural town here in the Eastern Cape under OR Tambo region. In this place, things are happening here because our area is mostly rural and underdeveloped. You can see it is a, the part of the former Transkai homeland. So here, the crime is on a high, there is gender, high prevalence of gender-based violence. There's unemployment, lack of service delivery, and there is poverty in our areas. So Lusiki City is, is regarded as the second highest in, 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 in gender-based violence. In, in the whole of the province. It is the second from the Kabeha area. So here women and children are abused every now and then. Even the old age women are accused of witch, witchcraft and are killed while they are sleeping. So I can say, yes, much is done, but not enough. So Lusikisi Paralegal Advice Center is the champion of human rights in this area. We are trying to normalize things through collaboration with, with other stakeholders and even with government departments. Okay. That's all I can say now, Lisa. That's great, Fanele. Thank you. Yes. So it sounds like even though you even though you are the only rural area and all the other areas here are predominantly urban, you're also highlighting some quite similar issues around underdevelopment. 
and marginalization, which I think are going to be yes. important as we continue the discussion. Okay. So, so thank you to all of you. I'm going to hand over to Zanele just to give us a quick overview of the Masi Pepe network. Zanele, you are muted if you're trying to speak. Oh, sorry, sorry. Good afternoon, all. Um, I'm Zanele Zwane from Center for Communication Impact CCI, uh, representing the Masi Pepe Network, which is a USAID funded, organ um, sorry, not organization, but a USAID funded project, um, which basically mainly speaks to uh, gender, reducing gender-based violence and looking at local governance responses in, 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 in different uh, parts of, 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 in different provinces of the country. Uh, the, the project is implemented by CCI in partnership with GHARU and five local civil society organizations mainly so on gender justice, uh, we have Achisa Nang, which is Achisa Nang Domestic Prevention, Abuse Prevention and Training ADAPT, commonly known as ADAPT. We have uh, the GDF, Gugudla Mini Foundation in Eteguini, KZN, and we have Etembeni Crisis Care Center also in KZN. And uh, lastly, we have a Project Support Association, Southern Africa, PSASA in Mpumalanga. Mm. aims to strengthen local governance to improve GBV response, which is essential to achieve the epidemic control in South Africa, HIV epidemic control in South Africa. And uh, Masipepe therefore is implemented in Gauteng, uh, in Deep and Orlando, by Songket uh, Gender Justice and, and Alexandra Township by ADAPT. And in um, Bumalanga, we have PSASA implementing in Bombela, uh, in specifically in Etlanzeni and Babaton, and in Emalaseni in the Gangala district. And then in KZN, we are in Eteguini where we are focusing in the ink area, which is Inanda, Duzuma, and Guamashu, and Eteguini West, working with GDF, um, Etembeni Crisis Care Center. The network seeks basically to reduce vulnerability to GPV by improving local governance and service delivery through strengthening the capacity of local structures to lead, coordinate, and manage a community response to GBV prevention and mitigation. Um, this is ba essentially basically what this means is that the project is supporting the execution of the country's white paper on safety and security, as well as the national strategic plan for GBV and femicide through the implementation of a package of technical and organizational development interventions to improve effectiveness and sustainability for GBV coordination forums and enable multi-sectoral collaboration to deliver innovative, integrated and evidence-led interventions. Uh, basically with the aim to one, strengthen community governance and accountability, uh, to increase primary and secondary prevention of GBV, uh, three, to improve uh, mitigation of GBV harms, and lastly, to improve access to justice for all victims and survivors of GBV. Um, so our implementation is basically, our approach and methodology is basically based on the ecological framework, which we use to examine and address a combined combination of individual, community, and social level society level risk factors that increase the likelihood of GBV in a particular setting. Therefore, our approach is achieved through GBV networks on, or what we call the Massey Pepper Network GBV forums in the different sites that we work in. 
where basically we either work with already existing forums or where there are no forums that we can work with, uh, we establish GBV forums that basically include government departments, civil society organizations that work with women, children, LGBTI groups, and persons living with disability, and local businesses, basically, in, in particular. I think we have made a, what we have championed in most of our sites is working with the taxi associations to, be, to, to, part, to participate in the network and to cultivate and sustain a multi-sectoral GBV action, basically. And the GBV forums, through the forums then, we are able to strengthen the local capacity of all the stakeholders to mitigate and address GBV holistically. Uh, we are Hi. Hi. Um, you, just to say your time's almost up. Oh, really? So basically yes. we're able to work through these forums to look at different ways on how we can enhance capacity, enhance accountability among stakeholders. And in the forums, we have two technical working groups. There's one that looks at um, behavior change communication and community responses that does outreach education, that does behavior change uh, interventions in the communities. And then there's another technical working group that basically looks at um, uh, uh, strengthening the criminal justice system so that people have more access to justice in the different sites that we're working in. So in a nutshell, that is what the project does. And our interventions are, are grounded in research, basically. So everything that we do is evidence-informed, and uh, we, we, we use that evidence, basically, to develop our programs and also to continuously look at where to improve and look at where the gaps are and the different information that is available. And then we can use that to channel people to services and also facilitate uh, engagement on issues of gender-based violence. Thank you. Thanks, Anelia. So I hope you, uh, all of our audience now has a sense of both the um, various organizers, Masi Pepe Network, UJ, Gender Health and Justice, and as well as our panelists who are going to be sharing with us their various experiences in their communities. So just to kick off, I'm going to do a very brief overview of um, the statistics that got us thinking about the particular problem here and the importance of why we need to be taking place into account when we start to think about violence. And the reason I think it's important to think about place is I want to give you a very two very simple examples just to illustrate this point is a lot of our focus right now is on behavior change. So posters that or community announcements that say men should not hit women or women should speak out. There's a lot of emphasis on individual change and behavior change and in particular changing difficult gender norms. But I think what we want to emphasize here is that gender norms come together and take violent expression in particular kinds of places. They don't just float in fresh air. And I'll give you an example. Let's take, let's take OR Tambo um, Airport in South Africa. If you look at the police's crime statistics, OR Tambo almost never reports rape. And of course, there are thousands, tens of thousands of people who, work through OR, who walk through OR Tambo every single day, all of whom may have very unacceptable gender norms, and yet it's a place that doesn't really allow for the expression of those norms in terms of violence. There's other kinds of crimes that happens at OR Tambo, and that has to do with the fact that it's a transport hub, and so you see a whole lot of crimes in relation to smuggling, such as drugs, plants, and money, but it's not a place where you necessarily see physical violence. So that's already an illustration of what I the importance I would like us to, to place on the idea of place and context, that places and contexts shape and, and, and enable particular kinds of violence. So our Tambo, as I said, there's a police station there that almost never reports rape. But what I want to do next is if we look at the police statistics, look at those stations where we do have very high levels of rape reported and, in, and challenge us to start thinking about what is happening in those, what is happening in those communities what is changing? Because these are numbers that have increased over the last decade. 
So what is changing there? What is it we need to understand in order to be able to think differently? And I think from some of the descriptions we've had, people have already talked to what some of those other things might be. So if we begin with the, we, if we look at the, an analysis of the police's figures for reported rape, and obviously I think we must say at the outset that um, we are not talking, we don't know what happens with rape that's not reported. So we don't know what's happening there, but the figures we're using here all come from reported rape provided by the police. And this is a study I was part of that looked at rape reported around South Africa in 2012. And I've just highlighted it here because you can already see that in different provinces, you see different kinds of patterns. So the highest number or percentage of stranger rapes in the country was reported in Mpumalanga, almost half. But in the Northern Cape, that had the lowest, only one, just over one in five rapes in the Northern Cape were by strangers. If we talk about acquaintance rape, rape between people who are known to each other, then that was highest in the Eastern Cape um, and the Northern Cape, but lowest in Mpumalanga, which fits with what we can see about Mpumalanga having a high rate of stranger rape. If we talk about rape between intimate partners, then we see another different pattern. Here we see the highest proportion of intimate partner rape being reported in the Western Cape, roughly one in five reps, but in Mpumalanga very low, again, because they are reporting this, these high rates of stranger rape. If we look at children, then KwaZulu-Natal is the province that far and away reports the greatest proportion of child rapes. More than half of the rapes in the province in 2012 were reported by children. So those 17 years and younger. In all other provinces, the bulk of those who report are adults. And then lastly, if we look at Northwest, that is the province that reports the highest proportion of multiple perpetrator rapes. It's much higher than the, the average, at 23%, almost heading towards between one in four and one in five rapes being multiple perpetrator, so two or more people, as opposed to a much lower national average. So this data at pro provincial level already starts to tell us that different things are happening in different provinces to shape rape. If we start to go down to police station level, then this data that I've used comes from the um, lists that the police provide every year of the 30 stations in the country that report the greatest number of rapes. These aren't always very easily compared because some, province, some police stations have much bigger populations of people than others, so more rape will be reported. Unfortunately, they don't give you those figures for how many, what the size of the population is that the station covers. So these figures aren't exactly perfect, but they help give us a sense of the top five uh, stations in the country that are reporting the highest rates of rape. And you can see that the pattern amongst the, the top five stations in 2019-20 is down. So both Inanda and Umlazi might be reporting the highest number of rapes, and the light blue shows what they reported in 2019-20, as opposed to what they were reporting in um, the earlier years, about a decade ago. You can see there's a definite decline there, and Cookie will hopefully give us some insight into what might have happened in Inanda and Umlazi. But you can see from Mtata, which is now third, 10 years ago, it may have only had the 11th highest rate, but it's gone up over the last decade. Plessislar also going down, also in KwaZulu-Natal, Toyando Limpopo also going down. But those are your top five, the top five stations that report the greatest number of rapes in the country and what the police, and the police have identified as hotspots. I'm interested in these stations. Um, these are the ones where you've seen a 10% increase in rape over the last decade. And what is particular in the, the three stations we're going to focus on today, who we've asked to come and share their thoughts, are Dipslurk, Lusiki, Siki, and Delft. So 8% increase in rape over the last decade. And in fact, in the last quarter of the police's crime statistics, it was reported that they have actually overtaken Inanda the number of rapes reported in the country. So clearly, Lusiki Siki, things have changed over the last decade that we must pay attention to. The same with Delft in the Western Cape, you can see an increase by 34%. And in Dipslurt, you're also seeing a similar increase. 
I'm going to show you a slide next that explains part of the reason for this increase. But um, you can see there as well that if we look at the, that one year where there's looks like there were only 37 rapes in the following year, it jumped to 120. You'll, I'm going to explain to you now why we can explain that. But these three sessions are clearly places where we need to be paying a lot of attention to to understand what's happening. So this slide here, which the Institute for Security study shared with me, shows the difference that building a police station makes. So in two, Dipslut was built in 1994, 1995. It's one of the first settlements created after democracy. And it never had a police station. All crimes had to be reported at Douglas Dale, which was quite a distance away. And it was a very expensive pat, um, taxi trip. In 2010, you, a police station was built. So the blue line is a number of rapes reported to Douglas Dale, and the pink line is a number of, uh, of rapes reported to Dipsler police station. And you can see the difference it makes to just having a police station that's close by to how it affects your rate of reporting. So this slide here partly explains the increase in um, the number of rapes at Dipsert, but it doesn't tell us, I think, the whole story of what's happening in Dipsert. And what is interesting about Dipsert is if you Google Dipsert and you go and look at the Wikipedia entry, it says there, which is very interesting, it has a serious problem with policing. So I think from Given and Lindsay, we'll perhaps hear a bit more about that. So this slide helps us understand the difference that having a close by police station can make to reporting and why that might explain perhaps an increase in reporting. The last slide I want to talk to is what do we do in these areas where we have such high levels of reported rape? And I think through things like the NSP and other programs, there is this emphasis on behavior change programs for men. And I think we've been fortunate enough to have Sanke, and Gibbon's going to talk a little bit about this, to have actually put their program to the test. They put in a, 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 a randomized control trial where they put through, in Dipsert, a group of men who went through their program and a group of men who didn't, and then compare the difference on the basis that, well, and in the hope that the men who had been through this program would show a better um, would show would would reduce would report using less violence. So I think one of the comments just to make is that most of the programs studied in South Africa have largely focused on change in relation to domestic violence, and we haven't yet seen a program that has been able to succeed in reducing non-partner rape. So what the conclusion was after three years of research in Dipslut, um, and the programs included workshops and community mobilization, and given can give us a bit more insight into that. But the rather surprising conclusion that the researchers came to after looking at the results was that this was not a behavior change program that had been particularly successful. It didn't seem to have made much difference at all, and it may have made the most violent men increase their use of violence. So their study is incredibly important in challenging us to think that firstly, you can't just run any old program. All programs don't work equally. We have to understand what it is that prevents programs from working. That's the first thing. Secondly, their program had some success in Bushbuck Ridge, but not in Dipsert. So here again, there is this very important point about the difference that a place can make. And the researcher's conclusion about why, why the program might have had less success in Dipsert is that firstly, and this is going back to some of the words that both Lindsay and, and Given were using. It is an area that has a great deal of impoverishment, even though a lot of money has been poured into it to try and improve the situation. The men who reported some of the most use of violence were men who also reported having gone hungry um, quite often, and were also men who reported having quite high levels of depression. And Dipsos itself is a community where there are very low levels of community cohesion reported, and it's also um, a place where I think perhaps because it is still relatively new, unlike Athlone, which was the um, which was Caroline's example, isn't as settled perhaps as Athlone. So there may be particular factors within Dipslot that we need to be thinking about very seriously and also need to be thinking about how we tackle if we change the problem of violence. So the point is that 
Gendered norms are not independent of the social conditions in which they are shaped. That all people can have particular norms, we all grow up in the same society, but under some circumstances, it's not enough to try and change those norms. So I think what we want to do now in terms of opening up the discussion to the panelists and asking them to reflect on what we've seen here is to think about what else is it that we need to do in areas in order to, to reduce violence. The goal is not to say, oh, those are bad communities and bad people live there. It's to understand what are the extra pressures, tensions and deprivations and marginalizations and exclusions that might be happening that can make violence more likely. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to you, Given, to ask, you know, based on Sonke's experience of having run this program in Dipslut, what lessons did you take from this? Has it led you to change your programs in any way or to think of doing things differently? Uh, thank you, Lisa, and uh, thank you for a very um, insightful uh, presentation. Um, I think uh, just briefly to speak on the Sonke Change trial or uh, the Sonke Change, as we now call it, is that um, uh, the project uh, was uh, premised on mobilizing communities to take action, um, uh, simply uh, to bring about more gender, uh, equality, uh, gender equitable social norms. Uh, the theory underpinning the intervention is that um, through community outreach and advocacy, harmful values and practices can be transformed uh, towards gender equity and thereby reducing gender-based violence. Uh, some of the activities uh, for, the, uh, for the project included door-to-door uh, -door discussions, uh, the deploying of our CAT members, uh, that's a, an abbreviation of our community action team members, uh, the deploying of our CAT members uh, to challenge harmful norms uh, in the societies um, that they live in, in particular uh, in Deep Slots, because this is where the project uh, was ran, but um, also uh, just to challenge harmful gender norms and educating men in particular about uh, gender-based violence. And I think, as you've rightly uh, already said, uh, Lisa, the results were not quite what we expected. And we believe there's a, a number of uh, reasons uh, for this. Uh, the first one is we believe that change um, is incremental. Uh, we had set an 18 uh, month uh, timeline for this particular project. Obviously uh, not enough time uh, to, to, you know, to, I suppose, um, make an impactful change. So that was the first point. But the second point was we needed to um, reconsider our interventions. Our interventions, as I already said, they include workshops, they include dialogues, but we felt like uh, how effective are workshops, you know, in places of high trauma and poverty. Um, we found that we had a lot of problems, for example, incentivizing a lot of men to come to the workshops in the first place, simply because people had to weigh, I suppose, their options. Do they attend a Swanky workshop or do they find means to uh, make money, for example? So that was one of the things that we had challenges with in terms of in incentivizing people to come to the workshops, but also uh, reworking and relooking um, I suppose the method which we're currently using, which is uh, the workshop. But I think the last and final point, uh, Lisa, is the um, we're seeing now the need to perhaps reimagine how we uh, define violence. As we go through our workbooks for the particular project, we realize that we may have perhaps looked at uh, violence at a one dimensional lens which is simply to reduce violence to, sim, uh, to the physical act of violence. And if you go enough, um, go through a lot of studies of gender-based violence, you do realize that physical violence is a uh, accumulation of various other means of violence and oppression. And we realize that while our focus was on actually the physical uh, uh, element of violence, we had uh, perhaps uh, negated other forms of violence that are not necessarily uh, physical. So to answer your question, I think um, the results show that we needed, um, uh, we still need to uh, relook our interventions, uh, but not to take away from the project. I mean, uh, there are, there were areas uh, of uh, improvement, I suppose, um, particularly on the educational part of site where 
uh, people were to some extent now being able to identify particular social norms, being uh, able to identify particular uh, toxic cultural norms. And I highlight this because initially, uh, when we brought up, for example, the issue of perhaps uh, toxic uh, cultural uh, norms or um, toxic uh, social norms, a lot of people uh, were quite apprehensive uh, because we must remember that a lot of people identify themselves through their culture and identify themselves through their social values. So I can say that then, um, despite the, um, the numbers that were not so pleasing, we were pleased with people's ability to take a step back and hold each other accountable to some extent as far as um, the um, execution of, of uh, toxic uh, social norms. So I think um, despite the disappointment of the overall results, um, we were uh, quite happy with um, some improvements that we've uh, been able to make uh, within the community of Deep Sleep with this particular uh, project. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Kevin. And I don't think, I think when things don't work out the way we want, they're just as important as the things that do work the way we want them to, because it's only that's how we learn. Um, and what it's really important what your trial has taught us and the questions it's encouraging you to ask in terms of helping us to think through some of the difficulties. I see we have two participants raise their hand. I just want to ask Theodora if she can um, give Lindsay permission. She's logged in as Lindsay Sampson. She had to log out because Dipsert ran out of power went off. So she's had to log in using and doing something different. So um, Theodora, if you can let Lindsay Sampson speak can i see you there lindsay do you want to try speaking okay while well, we sort out um lindsay i want to shift to you farida um as based in in delft i mean you've heard some of the discussion around Dipslut, some of the challenges that it faces. You yourself have been working in Delft for a long time. You work at the police station. Tell us a little bit about we were, we were actually first contact point when it comes to right and GBV cases, you know. Mm -hmm. And for eight years, I've uh, coordinated the Delft Steps Victim Empowerment Group. And the very reason why I left, because we are held within a scope. There's a limit to services that you have to give. And if, if you're from a, a community and you're passionate about um, child protection or women, the protection of women and children in, in, the, in, the, in the nutshell, that scope doesn't work for, for me as an activist. That was the reason that I stepped back because you can't just um, have a, a survivor come to your office, phone FCS, they have to wait hours for FCS to come. And many times, a lot of the survivors walk away from the police station because they're sitting for hours waiting on detectives. The things that we face every day. I mean, we, I'm sitting now here in the Hague area. So it's also just a suburb in Dow. But um, people come to our offices to, for, for assistance. But if it wasn't for the relationship that we built with the Tuzela Center, and then we wouldn't have had access to any services for people that comes to us for, for assistance. I mean, if try a 14 year old coming to you three days, three days behind each other, she was raped by her uncle and still waiting on the police to come. What do you have to do? We, we take our own transport, we transport them to the Tutusela Center. That's the only thing that we can do to ensure that the people do get services that they, that they require. But um, from what I've heard, Lisa, I'm quite astounded because I, I hear a lot of interventions and outreach that's happening in other areas. It, it, it's something great. I, well, I won't be negative, and I, I, some, some things we can try and doubt because honestly, nothing is happening in doubt. Our people, if you tell a guy that he shouldn't smack his girlfriend around for what you to tell them, they don't think that that is domestic violence. They don't even think swearing is part of domestic violence. Because for them, it's all about if you beat her, the, the blood must come out or she must be, you know, she can't barely walk, then it's domestic violence. So we need to get GBV education more out here in our suburbs. And 
language barrier is also something very huge here, especially with the diverse community that we, we have. We have 12 different cultures. I mean, uh, yeah, where I'm sitting now, we have a feeding scheme every day and we serve those people and you can see the challenges that arise because they don't understand each other's languages. Yeah. So you highlighting, you highlighting the fact that when people are often very, very different, it can be more difficult for them to get along? Are you suggesting that that might perhaps be a contributor to violence? That where, community, that where there's a lot less community cohesion, there might be more levels yeah. of violence? Yeah, it can be. From what I've experienced yeah, in, the, in the workspace and the environment that I've been, it's difficult because especially if you, I as a person don't understand all the different languages. You can't always intervene, you know, you try to mediate mm -hmm. it or you know, bring something to a point of understanding when you can't understand the, the different languages. And, and people, mm -hmm. they argue in the lines of uh, some, for what might be simple to us, but for them it's not because the one with, they, they would literally fight on who was first in the line. And But in the, the, the language, they don't understand each other. That's where the conflict also arises. Mm -hmm. So that's an important point about very significant differences where people can't even communicate with each other can be a factor for violence. Lindsay, yeah. can we come back? Thank you. Lindsay, can we come back to Dipsa? Yes, also hi, Lisa. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I think Dipsa also is very diverse. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, so I mean, adding on just, just a couple of the things that Given had pointed out, um, just in terms of describing the community and some of the features that I think um, contribute to levels of high levels of crime generally, violence generally, uh, and gender-based violence specifically. Um, you know, very, uh, very densely populated, very overcrowded, um, very diverse population, which includes, you know, both, you know, different tribes, different South African tribes, as well as then foreign nationals from other neighboring African countries. Um, oftentimes when there is xenophobic violence in South Africa, it will um, spark in Dipslut as well. Um, you also have, as Given said, high levels of poverty with people living either on or below the margins. Um, you have high levels of employment. There's also a lot of informal businesses, you know, people just hustling to try and, but it's a survivalist mentality, um, roadside stands, setting up small shops, spazas, those sorts of things. Um, in addition, you see that there's poor service delivery. So basic government or municipal services. So things like water, <laughs> electricity, as mm -hmm. the case may be, um, sewage, trash collection, um, you know, tarred mm -hmm. roads. They're not, uh, and, and this is what's interesting. One of the things that's interesting about Dipsuit, which you may see in other places, is it's not characteristic of the entire community. It's certain areas have better kind of infrastructure and service delivery than others, even within a relatively small community. So there'll be certain extensions. So Dipsuit's divided into 13 extensions or areas. And there are certain extensions which have, uh, you know, which are, are very, very informal, um, which only have shack, you know, shacks for houses or shack housing, informal housing, um, where there's no water, there's no electricity, there's no roads, you know, there's just kind of little pathways in between these shacks. And then you have other parts of the community that have, you know, brick houses, bonded houses, RDP houses, um, you know, and in those parts of the community, there are, there is better service yeah. delivery. So it's also quite interesting to just see discrepancies or um, inequalities within the community mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing to speak about is just, um, Dipsoot is often viewed as a very transitory community. So people will use Dipslut as more or less an entry point to try and find work in Johannesburg. So they'll come here from other kind of either rural parts of, you know, South Africa or other Southern African countries, um, not intending to stay here, but kind of, as I said, using it as a transit point um, in order to try and find work. And then once they're able to find work, then move elsewhere. Um, and one of the sentiments or one of the consequences of this is what we've experienced is that you know that there's less maybe investment in the community um, that people just again they view that they're just kind of passing through so there's less kind of ownership or commitment to improving the community as well um, 
And then if I could just speak a little bit to your point earlier around the kind of policing problem, um, you know, Dipsut is known, it's kind of, it is infamous in South Africa as a community to, even if you've never been, you know of Dipsut, um, you know, for it's very just high levels of crime being quite dangerous. Um, and what we see is that there's little um, trust in the police. There's, there's just a breakdown in a relationship between the police mm -hmm. and community members. Um, if I were to generalize, there's little faith in the criminal justice system. Um, and because of this one consequence is that you often see um, instances of mob justice. So the community just being frustrated by what they perceive as the police's inability to address the high levels of violence in the community and taking matters into their own hands. Um, but, you know, another reason for high levels of crimes is that it it's, it's easy for criminals to hide, especially as I mentioned in certain extensions that there's no roads, there's no lights. Um, and there's actually certain parts of the community where the police will admit, you know, admit that they won't go. So if you're in a certain extension and you phone the police, the police will tell you that they're not coming because it's not safe for them to enter into those communities. And yet those are the same communities where residents of Dipsut uh, are, are living. So yeah, I mean, I could say, I could say a lot more, but I'll, I'll pause there. Thanks, Lindsay. I think you've given us a really, really complex picture of the difficulty and just reinforce the point that all communities are not the same and we really do need quite different approaches and that some communities need far more than others so i'm going to want to come to you caroline because lindsay has highlighted the point about um dipsert being very transitory a place where people are just passing through you are in athlone which is settled and i think what you what's also interesting in relation to the cape flats is Although Delft is not quite part of the Cape Flats, you, you share some similar problems, perhaps in relation to gangsterism. And yet, if you look at the police stats, Dips, uh, Delft, for example, would appear to have much greater problems of rape, murder, and assault GBH than, say, mm. places like Mitchell's Plain and Athlone. Mm. I mean, you, you, you work in these areas. What's your sense of the differences between them, Caroline? What do you think contributes... One of one of the things I think that that um, the Lindsay also mentioned is that Dalf is also used as a transitional area. A lot of people that come to Cape Town come into Dalf first, so it's almost like you you find something to do. It's a good place to hide for criminals. It's so far and widespread. It is, and 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 you know, I think Dalf was the first established. Um, you know, the Cape Flats is predominantly previously what pe colored people. And then Dalf was formed the first, and, and, and I know this sometimes sounds strange to anyway, but Lisa, this, you know, Dalf was the first township that was formed with blacks and coloreds. Huh? And so I think there was the them and us aspect in Delft. And if I look at Athlon and, and why Athlon is different. So we have lots of organized crime in Athlon. We know that Athlon is almost known again as the gangster paradise. So we don't have the one-on-one the -on -one violence as we have big gangster, we, we, we have organized gangsterism, we have organized substance abuses is high high on the list here in, 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 in Athlone. But Dalv in itself, the, the, the violence in Dalv is, is of such that, you know, you'll find foreign nationals fighting with a colored community. You find the colored community fighting with a black community. And like Farida say, you you you, you go there and it's it, they, they, there's a line for blacks and there's a line for coloreds. There hasn't been a really, I think pre pre ninety four we all thought we're gonna sing Goomba Ya once apartheid is dismantled and we're all gonna live happily ever after together. No one thought this through that that actually work needed to happen to integrate because remember apartheid separated us and now. Um, and, and, and apartheid separated us and now suddenly we're all together and there was them and us. So them and us doesn't always mean the foreign nationals and, and, and the South Africans. 
right here in Cape Town in Delft, and I still see Delft as part of the Cape Flats, Lisa. Um, so, so because I mean, Delft is ten minutes away from where I live, um, and so, so there's the them and us aspect. There is not that social cohesion. There's so many factions in Delft, whereas you find in an established area like Athlone, you know, there's there's um, in Athlone, we are organized, there's social cohesion, there's structures. So there's so many structures that has been here for years long, old structures. There's old activists like myself. We've been around, um, you know, so we've established, we, we've established ourselves. Here in Athlone, you won't find new gangs that jump up, but you go to Delve and there'll be a young gang that has been formed recently. You know, so, so yeah, huge differences. So that's why the crime is also so different or the violence um, perpetrators are different in Delft. I think you're making a very important point here, Caroline, and that's that we can't escape history so quickly and so easily. Mm -hmm. That there are mm -hmm. legacies here that we perhaps still need to be thinking through in quite complex ways. And that a problem like mm -hmm. gender violence comes out of a particular histories of resettlement. Yes. You're yes. talking about resettlement that occurred in what, the 40s or 50s, whereas Delft and Dipslert are much newer. And mm. so they are struggling and grappling with all these difficulties around how do you settle, but you're also talking about the problems of in, in a more settled area. Yes. So yes. that I mean, I think you, is really important. In, yes. If, if you look at uh, Athlone and, and, and the violence in Athlone would be gangsterism, big, we have huge gangsterism issues. We look at the violence, I mean, the intersections with, with um, gangsterism and GBV is quite high. Then we look at girls in gangs and how girls are used in gangs, what girls are used for in gangs here in the Athlone area. And also GBV displays differently or presents differently for us here in Athlone than it does in Delft. And, and, and like because of history, you know, we, we look at, mm -hmm. if we speak GBV, we speak about male rape, male rape in mm -hmm. gangs, I mean, is I, and, 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 and nobody speaks about that. So those are things that is for me, that I see as, as, as someone living and working in Athlone, you know, those are the things where presented to Farida would be very, very other, other matters around GBV, yeah. Thanks very much, Caroline. Um, can I go to you, Fanele? We've talked here about urban centers, where places where people come from other provinces in order to stay for a brief time before they go and look for work in the city, be that Johannesburg or Cape Town. Lusiki Siki is very, very different. You've talked about it being a rural area. So do you want to talk a little bit about what do you think are the factors that are perhaps playing a role in driving violence in Lusiki Siki? Are you there, Fenele, or have we lost you? Okay. I think it looks as if we've Fenele has lost his signal, so I hope he'll be able to join us um, again. So, Lindsay, you wanted to make a, a, a point before I go to Cookie? Yeah, Okay, Lindsay, are you able to make a point? Okay, you're unmuted, Lindsay. You muted again. Hi, sorry, sorry, Lisa. I was just rejoining, getting re-added as the panelist. I missed a question. Okay. Um, you, did you want to add something? Uh, no, I'm good. Okay, okay. So in that case, I'm going to move to you now, Cookie. I mean, Cookie, you've heard some descriptions of different province, problems in different provinces and in different kinds of spaces. So how does this compare to your experience on, in Umlazi and Inanda? And I mean, I think Umlazi is also interesting because it's also had its own issues of violence around Glebeland's hostel, Glebeland's hostels and some of the killings that have occurred there. So it also has a bigger history of violence there. But talk to us a little bit about Umlazi and Inanda and what you think contributes to violence in those areas, but what has also helped to bring it down, perhaps? Uh, good afternoon, once again, to everybody. Thanks, Lisa. 
I think, you know, listening to the previous speakers, most of the issues that they raised around what's happening in the communities are more or less the same in every province, you know, just slightly different. Uh, KZN is a patriarchal society, which we are aware of. And then we have uh, cases of Utukwala, you know, high sexual uh, rape and sexual assault, killing of LGBTIQA+, and things like that. There. So um, we have a lot of issues in the province. When it comes to the two uh, communities that you mentioned, Amlazi and um, Inanda, um, there's been a lot of cases that have come out from there. I'm just going to talk about what's happening right now. Um, from last year, we because we wanted to find out what was really going on in those two communities. And it was mostly down to cultural and traditional practices. And um, women not being able to speak out because of, um, you know, family pressure in the family, uh, not having another place to go to, no secondary support, those kind of things. We have a TCC in Amlazi based at Prince of Jenny Hospital, and they get cases every day. But you find that women will come in and report but not want to go further with the case because they frightened that, afraid to speak out for it to be made public or to go to court even for protection orders. We also have an issue around that, uh, that a lot of uh, women are applying for protection orders but don't go through with the cases because of uh, the fear of not being able to go back to their homes because of the family pressure. Um, we also found out that a lot of the young ladies, young girls, are also very vulnerable to sexual assault and rape, especially those in the, in the what you call it, in the, uh, the DUT, in the Technicon, you know, and, and those that stay in the res. There's a lot of um, cases that have come out of that. We have established from July last year uh, to May. Well, we're still in the process, but July last year, we established two rapid response teams in those areas. And from uh, and two other communities, Wentworth and the Itaquani area, we established four rapid response teams to deal with gender-based violence cases for referrals, follow-ups, and that kind of thing. So from July last year to May last, uh, May last month, sorry, there's how much I want to say. We've done almost 900 and something cases just in that period of 11 months, just with the four teams. So um, one of the things that we are also doing right now because of the cases that have come in, we have um, linked up with the Premier's office with the gender desk to set up a gender technical working group. But one of the things is that it's at that level, you know, and they got to come down to the district level to find out all the, all the indicators of the case. Sorry, just one second. Yeah, no, someone knocking on my door. Sorry about that. Um, so they have to come down from that level to find out all the, the history of the case to be able to assist. Now, one of the things that we have found out, because I'm not even going to speak about what's really going on, because the previous speakers have also mentioned all the issues in the community. There's no doubt that there's a critical need for responses that bring together all the actors in an integrated multi-sectorial approach. Because one of the things is that working in the province, because we work in the whole province, we found out that it's so fragmented and when you're looking at the police staff for Inanda and Amlazi, the stats are only coming from SAPS, but there are cases that are being reported to organizations that are not reported anywhere else because organizations don't have the central hub to report their cases. And these cases are getting lost. You know, unless they mention it to you in a meeting that they had cases, but they don't have a place, like a central hub that they can report these cases to. And we are losing numbers in that way, um, as in what, being able to see what kind of impact organizations or government departments are making, you know, besides getting the steps from SEPs. Um, we have a WhatsApp group 
of the 140 organizations where we talk every day, share information. We've got cases uh, where uh, organizations will ask for advice and support. But then at the end of the month or whenever the uh, reporting period is, as much as you know that that organization is doing work, there's no way for them to report their cases. If you fund it, the only places that you are reporting to is to your funder. So it's very difficult to get the true reflection of the stats on GBV uh, and rape and sexual assault. We all, when you talk about uh, social norms, I'm just jumping from here to there. When we're talking about social norms, we implemented a social mobilization prevention model uh, that included all the organizations and identified hotspots that we turned into violence-free zones. It was very successful. The gap year was we couldn't sustain it because when the funding got finished, uh, we worked with government and asked them to take over the things because the foundations were there already, but they also didn't have the funding. So it's very difficult to sustain hotspots. Uh, I mean, like where you turn hotspots into safety zones, if I could put it that way. Because if there's no funding, people in the community won't do anything to create that enabling environment. So it goes back to the way it was, high increase in GBV, high increase in rape, sexual assault, and all the things that go with this. Um, I'm just gonna also come to this, that in regard to service delivery, I'm coming from a grassroots level, and I want to speak about community-based organizations. We just had a thing of where we're establishing gender-based violence networks around the province so that they can come together to share information, share resources, skills, support, whatever. The problem here Thanks. is that, yeah, I'm almost one minute, uh, even one second. What we also found out here was that most of them are not even aware of the, the national strategic plan. How do you expect organizations to implement prevention strategies or to help to change social norms when they don't even know what's in the NSP. So these are all the issues that when you're talking about service delivery, you also need to look at the other side of the fence of who's providing the services, what kind of services are being provided, are the skills there. Um, there's so much we can go on. I'll carry on later on. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Cookie, because I think it will, be, it will be useful to hear a little bit later about how you created those violence-free zones. Farida, I see your hand up, and it looks like Fenele Hello, has rejoined us. Finally. Hello. Okay. Farida, do you have a quick question, or can we go to Fenele? If we can go to Fenele, um, I was just covered by this previous speaker. Sure. So, Fenele, I mean, I don't know how much you heard about some of the discussions we've had so far. But we wanted you to talk a little bit about Lusiki Siki. I mean, what do you think is changing in Lusiki Siki over the last decade or so? What is it that we need to pay more attention to um, <clears throat> to try to help address the problems of violence within Lusiki Siki? Fanele, if you are speaking, you are muted. Fanele, have we lost your signal again? Okay, it looks like Fanele may have lost his signal. So Farida, do you want to make your point? Lisa, I actually just wanted to bring it across to you. I don't know, you know of all the land invasions that's been happening in Dalt area. All those sites that have that, been vacated, that, you know, that the people have been occupying has been some uh, major hot spots, if they, they put it like that. We have rapes every weekend in this um, it's Corona village. It's, 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 it's all different names now, but it's, it's all open spaces that was in Dalt area, you know, even the sports field, all the open um, areas of the parks and stuff that, that's been, uh, the people just came to put up shacks and it wasn't Dalt people. It was people from all around, but not from Dalt. And um, we later found out that this, it was politically driven because uh, the shacks would come in during the course of the night and we just see new shacks the, the following morning. If we try to have the people vacated the, the next morning, but those shacks that's been there for now a period of five or six months, 
has been our dead zones. We've had so many family murders happening. This weekend we also had one of our recipients that was beaten to death by her husband. And just last Friday, she called me to, to ask me for a place of safety and she was supposed to come to me. But she never came and then Sunday afternoon I got the news that she was beaten to death by a partner. But the police was called out almost six times so very often. And then and our people you won't and a lot of people go for the interdicts. They are sent by the police station for interdicts, but they don't even have taxi fare to get to the to court, you know. They, so, the women are so dependent on these abusive men. And in many cases, these very same men is the men that's abusing the sexually abusing their daughters, their teenage daughters. And there's even now a trend with this um Congolese and the uh, Bongos or whatever the, but the Jakonga leash mostly, with our young girls between the ages of 12 to 16. And and you know that um, when I spoke to the communications officer of Dow, I don't want to mention his name, because I was quite irritated because I asked him if he's aware that a lot of human trafficking is happening within these shacks. And he asked me, what do I know about human trafficking? But clearly he had no understanding what I was talking about. You know, so I asked him now if you don't if you don't see this as human trafficking, do you at least see it as rape? Because the children are underage; they can't do anything if the parents don't come forth. As simple as that. That was his answer. But no intervention took place, and I've, I've reported quite over 20 cases to them, but nothing has been done about it. And these children are now out of school. These girls, these young girls, they don't attend school anymore since COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's a lot of that we have to deal with every day at the side. So I think what you re you're also raising these questions about the failures of, of, of policing, which I think are coming yeah. up in relation to Dipsert as playing quite an important role in just not making help available. But I think what you're also talking about is how violence or well, the conditions for violence change all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, COVID has created a situation where, where, where schooling has been disrupted, employment has been has been disrupted, and what you're pointing to is the way it creates new opportunities for, for violence. Yeah. Caroline, do you want to add something? So I, I just I just wanted to 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 also speak about um, you know. How are we in, in communities almost normalize the violence? And I think Farida touched on it a little bit, how um, you, you, you watch a queue form outside. So, so, I mean, one of the things that all of us as GBV activists has been doing since last year is now also feeding. And we know that poverty intersects with um, violence against women or GBV. And one of the things is that women stand in this queue because if they don't go home with food, there's, there's trouble at home and she gets beaten up because she goes and look for drug money, for food, say scuttle, you know, like she's hustling, a hustle, daily hustle to keep the family going. But, but one of the things is that it has become normal in our communities. It is, I see this, I mean, we, we, they're standing in a queue and I'm sitting in my office where I am, I can see outside. And you see the guy grab the woman by the head. Nobody, everybody's laughing because it's, it's so funny because it's his girlfriend, it's his possession, you know? So we've normalized the violence against each other. Two guys just, having a go at each other it's nothing and so therefore i mean albert marie is saying in in the chat lisa that maybe women should be armed and and i want to disagree with that i want to say you know what violence begets violence and and a, a and and just to armor with with something which is going to be can be used against her as well you know yes monday on on monday we had a close to abduction here in the area. And, and my first reaction in the community chat was, bring him out, I want to bring him to the woman so that we want to give him a, a hiding, the women want to give him a hiding. And I know it sounds like so easy, but immediately I said, I'm so sorry because I'm a leader in my community. And if I am an advocate for no violence, I wish I could take a panga and hit him, you know? 
but I can't do that. So my, I had to change my thinking of I wish we can give him a puck as, a, as women, you know, because, and, and I know the frustrations in communities how we feel we want to take up arms because police is not doing anything. And, and that is our immediate reaction. But because also those things, if I think of, those are things we need to unlearn, Lisa, if we're looking at behavior change mm -hmm. and behavior change starts with us as the leaders in the, in the community. And, and then I also want to say to Cookie Cookie, the NSP, and I hear, and I'm part of the NSP in that, but the NSP, I somehow feel like government is throwing so much money at the NSP and the NSP. Okay, somebody needs to mute. Yes, yes, I, I, I muted her. And then, and then okay. we, we're spending money on strategic things. But for us, as community-based organizations, we are saying, where's the intervention work that is going to see people's lives change? When are we going to stop having all this top structures where, and I know those strategic movements and, and uh, 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 is necessary, the, the NSP is necessary. However, we've been doing this for years. We need money in our communities for intervention programs. We need, we need, we, we need funders to say, um, how, how can we, you know, and I know research has been done. So the research is done and then what? What is the action and implementation plans after those research? If I look at the women that I work with daily, women that's in conflict with the law, substance abuse, gangs, women in gangs, you know, and those are all intersect with each other. So, yeah, um, thank you, Lisa. That's me for now. <laughs> thank you, Caroline. I would like to, for us to start thinking about what would be, you've talked about interventions, Cookie mentioned interventions, um, given has given some indication of interventions. What are the kinds of interventions that we need to be thinking about? So I'm going to come back to you because I think given has got his hand up. I also see participants who have their hands up, but I think perhaps because I'm on the panel, I can't see who has their hand up. So possibly if you want to put in the Q&A in the chat, if you- This was the name up and Nombini. Nombini okay. and Peliswa. Okay, great. So I saw Given. Can I go to Given and then go to Piliswa and Nombini? Um, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I think uh, the first point um, before I answer your, your question on interventions, I think um, Caroline said something that's, um, I think, quite powerful in terms of how naturally uh, you think, okay, uh, because this act of violence has occurred, um, then the best way to respond is the violence with violence, which, uh, which has shown that this uh, should not um, be uh, that way, simply because um, we, I'm always inundated, for example, with a, a lot of comments uh, in terms of, uh, for example, um, I get a lot of questions, uh, get, uh, I get also a lot of questions about chemical castration, for example, you know, uh, given the high numbers of rape, um, in South Africa. And, you know, I always say that the thing about, for example, incidents of rape, it's not necessarily about sex. Um, so um, once you, once you, you, you enact, for example, chemical castration on a particular person, uh, because sex, uh, rather rape is about power, uh, people then will still enact violence um, on a on a survivor or a, a potential survivor, so I, I always say that it's important for us then to introduce mechanisms that deal with the structural issues uh, rather than the particular incident of uh, violence. And then on that point, then just to segue into the issue of interventions, the thing is, violence, in particular, violence against women, is um, a structural problem. Uh, but it's a problem that needs to, I believe, looked at from two lenses. Uh, the first lens is the lens of causes. And then uh, after that, you can be able to then focus on the second lens, which is prevention. Uh, you can't necessarily prevent something you don't know what the cause of is. 
So I think as far as um, uh, prevention is concerned, we need to uh, honestly interrogate the uh, different social factors that contribute to the scourge. Now, I mean, there's a plethora of them, but I mean, uh, from the top of my head, we have a lot of, uh, for example, uh, some cultural norms, you have some social values, you also have, I mean, the um, an equal distribution of, of uh, the economy, et cetera. So any, for me, uh, prevention, not to give uh, a particular prevention, uh, but it's important for us to deal with each uh, social factor um, adequately. You, to, to, you mentioned something earlier, uh, Lisa, when you said that um, there's no one size fits all as far as places or locations are concerned, but there's also no one size field, uh, fits all in terms of the dis uh, different structural elements uh, that contributes uh, mm -hmm. to the scourge of gender-based violence and just uh, violence in general. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Police, given the Police, way, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for this discussion. I just want to ask, I'm just wondering from my side, um, with regards to the work that you're doing within these communities, how much of your own personal lives are affected um, within this violent as, as activists? And also in, in cases where there's, there's, there's violence, do you actively go out to, um, to resolve whatever the conflict may be, or do you wait for the victim to come to you? I just want to get clarity on that. And then um, the last one will be, I just wanted to understand what Given was saying about making money and incentives. I didn't get that part, sorry. Thank you. Great questions, please. Do you want to quickly answer that one, Given? Lisa? Yeah, sure, uh, 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 please. So thank you for that question. Uh, what I meant uh, by that, uh, please, so is that um, our, a lot of our projects are driven by our community action team members. And these, uh, I need to stress, um, they are volunteers. Um, so what I was saying about incentivization is that uh, sometimes in these, uh, when implementing these projects, a lot of people ask what's in it for them. Mm. You know, uh, so uh, it is hard even for me, for example, to convince someone that, um, okay, despite not being paid, this, this, and these are the benefits. When, as I've mentioned, the work, the areas in which we work in, the severe poverty, the severe trauma. So, uh, without the promise of something tangible, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it becomes. Uh, very hard to to convince people to participate on on you know in the workshops and then just to start on the on the first question that you asked I, this is for me now on a much more personal level where so like i said i'm sonke's communications and strategic information manager um and i know i said part of my job is to talk too much but i, I think apart from that is um the releasing of press releases and engaging the media and that has made, uh, in a lot of ways, my, for example, my personal number very much available in the public domain. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a lot of instances of um, uh, people calling me. Uh, I'll give you an example of, for example, men uh, calling me uh, just to, for example, to highlight, do you know how many more men were killed today and you guys are busy reporting on women? For example, you know, I get asked that a lot. Uh, what type of man are you? Are you not talking about our issues and, and stuff like that? And then I also get questions because I mean, I, I control the organization's communication in society, it's social media platforms, Facebook, everything. So even uh, incidents that are reported, uh, they start with me most of the time. Uh, which means I have to always process that trauma first, mm -hmm. you know, before taking um, the necessary steps. So in terms of coping, unfortunately, one of the things I've, I've done now is I've set a day in in the week where I do not answer uh, phone mm -hmm. calls. Uh, I find that um, if you do not deliberately step away, mm -hmm. uh, given the severity of gender-based violence, not only in South Africa, but in the world, then I'll never stop working, you know, continue uh, relieving people's trauma, retelling people's mm -hmm. trauma. Um, but also um, 
one of the things, I know you didn't ask this, one of the things that I've challenged myself also as a man is to be able to take a step back uh, in terms of uh, gender-based violence um, is really violence uh, of, uh, by men on women, you know? And I, in a lot of instances, I try to take the back seat as much as people can perceive me as the organization's spokesperson, et cetera. But I can't wholly, as a man, speak on women's experiences. So um, that's one of the other things that I've, I've, I've done um, to, to personally cope is to actually let women, as much as I am an advocate for women's rights, but I can't wholly uh, articulate the experience. So um, I do have a lot of instances where I let uh, women uh, take the lead and let women tell their own uh, stories. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lisa, can I just add? My, my head, please. I, I just want to say to, to Peliswa, and, and I want to latch on to what Kivana said. It is very difficult. And just this morning, I said to a funder, you know, I wish I had more resources because I cannot deal with strategic matters and on the ground matters. So right now in the organization, you deal with so much. And then you've got people that says to you, I can give you interns, but interns needs training. So it's not a resource that I can even use right now because they can send two, three intern and interns here, but it's going to take away more of my time. So in fact, it, it, for, for initially it, will, it won't help me. Um, so, so, so that is the one point police. So, I mean, I got into the sector as a volunteer for rape crisis. However, I had a bookkeeper job in the private sector. So, and, and then I worked my way into the sector. And so you do not see that often anymore. And I think because of the levels of poverty, everybody, it, it's too challenging to give up your time because yeah, anyway, so 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 that is about compensation. And I want to say to, to uh, given what, just to latch on there to what given us is, but also how do we cope? And police well, for, for us that work in communities, at times, I mean, I was on the scene where a man just murdered his wife. And so the first call, first call was to me. And so I jump in my car and I go there and we don't know what we're going to find. We wait for the police to come. Um, we got there before the police. He's still inside with the children. So a lot of the times you find with us as activists that live and work in the community, we do set ourselves. I mean, I jump into fights. I've ran out here in my pajamas um breaking up fights with with husbands and wives and i did because i'm called out to do that so so you do put yourself at risk however many of our cases it's like we're an advisor office we run an advice office and women will come here the the family comes to us and that but we also do put ourselves at risk a lot of the times how do we take care of ourselves very, very, very few of us, or most of us, never ever take time out. And and I mean, I've just had a very close personal loss. Thank you, Lisa, for having me here today because I battled to get out of bed for, for a while. And so, but then again, you see the need, you see, you know, and, and, and this makes us continue. And you have the knock at your doors, you have the call at your gate. Um, Farida will tell you, living and working in a community, it's very hard. Sometimes I wish I lived on another place where I can leave here by six o'clock at night and go and live somewhere else. But this is unfortunately also where I work and live and where my, my the, the constituents or the recipients of my services are. So um, yeah, thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Caroline. I, I'm getting messages that people are raising hands, but I can't see them. But I've seen somebody's put stuff in the Q&A. Okay. But before I get there, I would like to um, go to Fanele, who's back with us, because I think it would be good to hear your experience in Lusiki Siki. I think especially yes, because you are from a rural part of South Africa, and we certainly hear about the rural mm. experience. So are you, are you with us, Fanele? Yes, Lisa. Can you hear me? OK. Hello. Yes, we can. Lisa? Hello. Can, yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Fanele. Please yes. go ahead. Yes, Lisa. As, as I said before, 
our area is very, very much a remote area. So it's difficult to, to reach other places when we are doing policing here. That's why the, the crime is only high here. The other problem is women in the rural communities are not empowered enough about their rights, you know? They need to be empowered on their rights and they need to be educated on the concept of gender-based violence so that they can understand gender-based based violence. The other factor is here, the culture and religion is playing a very, very important role rather on the spread of gender-based violence, you know? Women here are taught to obey their husbands or partners. They can leave their partners or husband even if they are abused physically, sexually, or otherwise. So there's a lot. Have we lost you, Fanele? Fanele, have you gone again? Okay. That's so a pity because a I think he was sharing with it's us. Very much a problem. Fanele, Hello? what do you think? Hello. What happens Hello? to women if they do try and leave? What is it that makes it hard for women to leave? How do how do they what are the barriers to them being able to leave? What makes them feel they have to stay with their partners? I, I think is a belief. Uh, I think is a belief that if you leave your house, being lobola paid to I mean to your to your parents or to whoever you belong to, you, we have we, we don't have to leave that house. Even if you are beaten, even if you are insulted, if you are emotional abused, that is part of culture here. It, 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 because if you go back to home, the in-laws have to take the lobola back, you know? So we need to change that behavior now. That can be changed through, I mean, education, you know? It's part of culture and even in, in, in their religion. They are, they, they, the women are taught to obey their husbands, no matter what, you know? Mm. Yes. Mm. And now so you've to... talked about the importance... Uh -huh. Hello? Sorry, go ahead, Fanele. Now we have, we have to educate our women to empower them about the gender-based violence, they must understand those four, four, three stages of gender-based violence. Once it's on this tension phase, I mean, the, 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 the women has got to leave that man, you know, because it will result finally into death, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think the lack of knowledge and education here on the part of their rights, you know. Lobola mm -hmm. doesn't mean she can be beaten, she can be killed, you know? Right. Lobola is that the relationship between the two families, not to give the men the authority to abuse. Here mm -hmm. in Poland, it's so strict that you don't have to go back to your home and leave the husband there, you know? There is mm -hmm. a saying that if we are, are, are married to, to a man, your grave is there. We have to be buried there, you know? That's why the men have got the power over, over women. They know she can't go anywhere, you know? So we have mm -hmm. to change that mindset, real. We have to change that behavior. Now, because women are being abused in this way, you know? Mm -hmm. I Thank you, Fanele. I was also going to talk about the lack of co coordinated approach 
to fight gender-based violence. Here, we are supposed to have a forum that is led by SAPS. SAPS has got no resources. We can't fight crime with one vehicle on the, the wall of Mississippi City, you know? Mm. So we have to mobilize, uh, we have to mobilize the resources. And then there must be forum. Okay, have we lost you again, Fenele? Okay, Fenele, I think we, are hello, you back? Hello. Hello. Oh, yes, go ahead, Fenele. Yes, yes. Fenele, you were talking yes, about- I was saying, Lisa, because our area is, is, is too big, you know? So we have to have forums, even at what level? There are 32 mm -hmm. words here. The only forum that is operating, I, I don't know whether it's the main forum, is operating here near Lusikisik, not far, 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 far from Lusikisik, you know? And we've got to, to I mean, we've got to, 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 to follow those national events, you know, the Women's Day and the just and, and, and what is the youth days, you know, so that people can be educated mm -hmm. according to these events, you know. We mustn't wait for first mm -hmm. season to come and say, no, let's go and protect women because it's towards December now, it's towards the eighth day. No, this must be the everyday duty for us to do here in Sikisi. I I mean. All in all, there is no coordinated approach here just to fight gender-based violence. We need to have a coordinated approach. We need here to have all stakeholders on board. People in here are, are, are working in their in, in silos, that is in, in that corner, in that corner, in that corner. We need to be united, united in order to fight this gender-based violence here. And we need to provide the, 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 the rehabilitation centers for those people that are abusing substance. You know, Lusiki City is well known to grow the high year, you see. So it is sold to youth because youth are unemployed. They, they take their frustrations and smoke the aha, you know, and they commit those crimes now. The most vulnerable people in this are women and children, girls, women and children, and old people, you know. Thank you, Fanele. I think you've highlighted a lot of additional issues to think about. I think especially in rural areas where you have these problems of distance and where I think out of sight, out of mind, people don't think about rural areas. They don't think about how to particularly difficulties you face and what needs to be done about them. I want to go to Farida and Cookie, and then we'll move to um, the questions that have come up in the Q&A um, as, as, uh, that, are, that are being raised, which I think are also some very rich questions for us to consider. So Cookie and Farida, did you want to add something? Can I just come in here quickly, Lisa? It's Cookie. Go ahead, Cookie. Um, you know, one of the things that we have uh, a, a huge concern about is that a lot, just before COVID, about 200 new social workers were recruited by GSD. That was launched by the Premier. And they're supposed to be positioned at police stations and shelters and the various uh, service points. But if you go to a police station after hours, you cannot get a social worker. If you go on a weekend, your, ca your case will wait for the social worker till the Monday. So there's a huge gap there because you find that some of, a lot of the women are also sleeping at the police stations with their children because there's no vans or there's no place in the shelter. So that's a, a real uh, concern there. Um, the other thing that we also picked up was that when, case, uh, when, a, when a survivor goes to a police station, they don't open a case. They send it to court to go and get a protection order. And they're not aware that they can open the case and apply for the protection order at the same time. 
And then a lot of the women will not go to the courts to apply for the police station, I mean, for the protection order, because they feel that the, uh, the perpetrator or the abuser will withhold money from them, the finances. So they are not even aware of the interim monetary relief that's in the protection order, in the application. So that they won't apply for that day because of the perpetrator withholding funds. So they're not aware of the interim monetary relief in the protection order. Um, organizations are filling in the gaps in service delivery because of the lack of due diligence from government departments. So if we're having a problem with service providers, how do you move people from a sense of inaction to inaction? What is really the tipping point that's going to ignite this so that we can look at primary prevention, you know, on uh, turning negative social norms to positive social norms? I also want to go on to just answer the, the, the ladies that asked about how do we take care of ourselves? And I think Caroline also answered that. Just last night, I had a call from a survivor that wanted us to come and pick her up. And we said to her that we can't, you can come to the office. I referred her to one of my team members and she told the both of us off and said, what, you're like useless because I'm looking for help and uh, I need transport to come and pick me up. So if we have to go there, we are also placing ourselves in danger because there's no van at the police station to be able to even go with us to pick up the survivor. So she told us both of and told us that we were useless just for the fact that we could not go pick her up. You know, and um, so these are issues that we face. And then also, yes, Caroline, we do suffer a lot with fatigue, but we go on, you know, you want to throw in the towel as a service provider because you don't get called in the day. Your calls come in at night and you got to get up and you got to help uh, assist the person. You leave your home even at one, two o'clock in the morning to take a survivor to a shelter if there's place and that kind of thing. So when you talk about service providers taking care of themselves, you have to do what you need to do to be able to help yourself. I like what uh, Given said that sometimes you just have to step back, but sometimes it's very difficult, even when you want to throw in the towel and you tell yourself, I'm so tired, I can't go on. But when that call comes in, as headline says, doesn't matter where you are, what you are doing, you get up and you just do it. And it doesn't even matter about lack of resources. All you are thinking about is, let me assist the survivor. And that's how we function as civil society. Thanks, Cookie. Farida, did you want to add something? Lisa, we, we, we all are aware of our victim support rooms at our police stations, and we all know that it's standing dormant. And um, I just want to encourage my fellow sisters and women rights activists on this group. Maybe we should take the ownership of our victim support rooms as 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 service providers, as, as, as community workers, you know, organizations as well. Maybe we should step into getting our victim support services more active because ultimately the victim support services should be um a combination of, of, of all services that are rendered in the area. But um, somehow, some way, there's a gap, a, a major gap, because I mean, the, the, the facilities are there, but it's not being utilized for the, for the reason that it's been established, to put it like that. Because I mean, Dallas will also have a very nice park home, but it's not being utilized. So what, why do we, 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 we why don't we as, 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 as community workers or activists maybe just start the maybe in creating, you know, the services, get all, all the stakeholders under one roof and the victim support facility could be the starting point. I don't know. I'm, I'm just thinking out, out of the box. Yeah. But maybe that should be a starting point to, to bring about change. Mm -hmm. Or maybe make things more accessible. Yeah. Caroline? Lisa, I know we're running out of time, but I just one minute and, and then I really have to run. But I just want to, to say, you know, just reading the, 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 the questions and, and uh, Sheila Sasulu pop um, a, a question in the chat. Don't you think by focusing exclusively on poor, undeserved and largely black communities, the researchers inadvertently imply that domestic violence is a function 
of the above mm -hmm. conditions or occurs only in such spaces. And I want to say to Sheila, um, we are well aware, aware that it doesn't um, GBV affects all color creeds, um, social standings. I often say rich people have other resources. So we find black and colored women in shelters, but we know that white women go all, all rich black and colored women also go to clinics. They book into clinics for two weeks. They would go to family members. You know, there's other resources. So we know that it doesn't just affect, but we know that the, 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 the big numbers are in the, because economic, economics plays a huge part in GBV. Poverty is a driver of GBV. So those are another, Lisa, and thank you for this platform. I really need to leave now. I've got something else starting at 3.30. But I also want to say to you, Lisa, thank you for this opportunity. We really need to keep this engagement, even by looking at the chat and the questions in the chat about, you know, different women. And I, and I sometimes feel like working uh, Cookie with Cookie. I've been working with Cookie almost 30 years. And I look at questions still coming up in this chat now. Um, and I feel like, wow, we have a long, we have a far way to go. You know, lots of education needs to happen. Lots of awareness needs to happen because, because some of these, these, these co comments in the chat makes me want to think, sure, um, how much more work we still need to do. So thank you, Lisa, for the opportunity um, for, for this afternoon. Thanks. Thank you, Caroline. Oh, um, Lisa, sorry, can I jump in? Yes, you can. Sorry, yeah, this is Lindsay. Um, I just wanted to um, just kind of put a different idea on the table, going back to the question you'd asked around, you know, potential solutions and and especially with the intention thinking about the place in mind and the place's contribution to violence and enabling violence to occur. Um, and, and just thinking more than just, again, uh, beyond kind of the criminal justice system and, and, mm -hmm. and service delivery in that aspect, um, and thinking more about actual kind of physical conditions, right? And so what, what are things that can mm -hmm. be done and maybe where are other what are other strategies that NGOs can employ in order to prevent or reduce levels of violence from happening and occurring in the first place? Um, and I'm specifically thinking about things like lighting, street lighting. I'm specifically thinking about things like um, sewage and um, you know not having people need to use facilities and bathrooms and pit latrines and toilets that are outside. Um, because the research, I mean, and it's not just in South Africa, it's in you know developing countries around the world showing that that actually has a um, an impact in terms of either kind of increasing or decreasing um, uh, perpetration of violence when you have more or less street lighting, when you have access to kind of sanitation and you have access to indoor toilets and water and and um, those sorts of um, those sorts of of resources. So just kind of putting that out there in terms of a different and just a, a different, more creative way of thinking, um, potentially to reduce levels of violence in, in these communities where it's identified that, um, that that could be contributing factors. Mm. Lisa, can I just come in there? Just one second, I'd like to answer Lindsay, please. Uh, Lindsay, we conducted, uh, implemented the woman's safety order based on everything that you said, looking at lighting, signage, environment, all those kind of things. So I think yeah, there is a model, we have implemented it. Um, we need to talk about the turning hotspots into violent-free zones and including the women's safety audit in there. Thanks. Thanks, Cookie. I can see people have got. I can see people putting up their hands, but I can't say who it is. Uh, if it's if it's amongst participants, so my apologies if I, if I seem to be ignoring you. But I think there are a couple of really important issues that are being highlighted and suggesting to me that maybe at some point we want to look at another seminar that does look specifically at this question of economics. I mean, because the Gen V uh, research project is based on Alex and Santon, specifically so that we can, um, amongst other things, look at this question of what difference does income and class make? Because I think one of the things about being middle class or having access to resources is the fact that you do have things like you can pay for private security, you can pay for private health care, you can pay for a psychologist. So you might still be subject to the same kinds of violence, but you have a lot more options open to you. 
but that said, I think there are particular difficulties and I perhaps would, some of my co-researchers on the project would like to briefly touch them, but there are other difficulties that come with um, appearing to having made it in life. And I think there the pressure may be for you not to speak because you are trying to look like you've succeeded in life and your life is great, but admitting to violence undoes that. And I can certainly remember some years back working with women and uh, we were doing some training there in the Sanson police station making this very interesting comment, which was to the effect, and she was a white woman, she said, you know, I always thought domestic violence was something that happened to, and uh, I think those of you who come from the Cape Flats will find this interesting, I thought it only happened to poor coloured women. I didn't think it happened to middle class educated women. So it took me a while to realise what was happening in my life. So I think there are some very important questions to be asked around how questions of income, race, history, perceptions about each other may quite clearly have a, a role to play in making violence more or less recognizable depending on, um, on where you, you come in, in life. So that is, I think, a really important point and I think possibly something we could look at in a future webinar are, are these questions of what difference does it make when you seem to have resources? Um, yes. So we are coming to the end of the webinar and I really do apologize if there's people's hands I haven't seen and who I have missed out. There have been some wonderful complexities added, I think, to the conversation um, that I think really challenge us to think about context, history, legacies of the past, and I think also the enormous difficulties. Um, to go back to Fenele's point, we're 25 years into democracy, but you still have great difficulty in undoing some of the ideas that the constitution supposedly opposes. So there's a great need for us to think in more complex ways. And I think some of you have started to raise that we need to be thinking about issues of infrastructure, but we also need to be thinking about community cohesion. How do we help create bonds between people when they are very different from each other and might feel very much in competition with one another over resources? How do we address that? I think within the context of a country, especially now after COVID, has faced a great many challenges. In fact, has even fewer resources to be able to go around. So the questions are, what is that going to mean for us in the future, especially when so many when all of our panelists are speaking of how important resources become to this work. So I think the different ways in which economy both acts as a dependency trap, how it limits options not only for those who perpetrate violence, but those who experience violence and those who try to do something about violence is clearly a really important one. Um, so I think this question of resources may be one we want to look at in great de in, in much more detail in future. So unless is there something that one of our panelists would like to leave us with as a burning issue before we go? Something that they that has occurred to them that they think would be very important to share. I think Lisa, uh, just on my side, in I'm. Um, you know, I always highlight the fact that in um, rallying communities, you know, in, in the fight or, or rather the engagement of gender-based violence, we need to be very mindful of not burdening survivors um, as survivors do not perpetrate uh, these, uh, you know, crimes against themselves. So uh, in talking mm -hmm. about uh, women uh, needing to, to I, I suppose, educate themselves in gender-based violence, I think, we need to be careful on not putting the responsibility on someone who's actually a survivor, you know, and someone who's not perpetrating the, the violence uh, on themselves. But in, in the main, in, in general, I, I do think as communities, as bystanders, we really all have a part to play. Thank you very much. Um, any other points for the panelists? Can I just but say, I think once uh, you've all... Oh, sorry. Cookie. Okay, just a last Go question. Ahead, Despite all the work that's been done over the years, all the research, the implementation, the programs and everything, 
I would like to leave this question. What is still keeping gender-based violence alive? Why are we still sitting with this problem? As you heard, we in this work, the years, we've done it all. Mm -hmm. Lisa, you've done it all. And a lot of the people in the panel and quite a few of the attendees have been in the sector for years and years. Mm -hmm. Why, and despite all the work that we have done, so I'm gonna leave this. Why are we still sitting with this problem today? Mm -hmm. What is still keeping us alive? Thank you. Caroline, are you about to leave or did you pop in to tell us, give us your wisdom on this final point? <laughs> I, I, I stepped out quickly and I stepped back. Um, yeah. So, so like Cookie says, you know, what is still, and I think, you know, sometimes you want to throw in the towel because we've been doing this so long, but things are just looking worse. Um, but what is keeping it alive is social norms, its behaviors, it's, you know, many, many other factors. So and until we can, can really put, a, put something to it, but I think again, awareness raising, um, we, we cannot educate enough in every, per, every household, every, you know, we are not going to, and I think many years ago, Cookie, if you remember the Network on Violence Against Women, I had no men in our organizations, there was a thing around that, but I mean, we've learned and we've journeyed so long and hard, unless we come together and do this collaboratively, um, you know, multi-sectoral, we're going, not going to be able to dismantle gender-based violence, so it's going to take awareness raising platforms like these, but it starts with me, like I said, changing my thinking. The first thing I said, when I saw violence, I wanted to use violence. So it's about things like that, you know, how are we gonna change behaviors? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Caroline. I think, you know, in conclusion, you've started to point to why we haven't made the kind of progress we'd like to in the last 30, 30 years. And that's because you, it sounds like what you are saying is that you can't think that gender-based gender violence is not independent of problems like racist histories, mm -hmm. ongoing problems around social cohesion, difficulties around service delivery, lack of infrastructure, economy, class, which can work whether depending yes. on whether you're middle class or whether you are poor, the absence of a broader infrastructure of support. So, mm -hmm. It might be expecting too much to think that just doing work on norms all by itself is going to change the problem. I think the challenge to us is to think about these broader contexts and how we get much more movement in understanding this web of facts as they come together to produce a moment of violence. Mm -hmm. So I hope that the first webinar has pushed us all to start thinking about that. And I'd like to invite you to attend next week's webinar where we're going to be talking about some of these safety apps and safety audits that Cookie referred to and how we can be using those in quite concrete mm -hmm. and practical terms mm -hmm. in terms of um, changing environments and making them safer. So yeah. once again, thank you very much to everybody for sitting through the two hours. I really hope you learned something from this today. Thank you for all the insights to the panelists and we look forward to hearing you next week and continuing on with this discussion. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, bye.